episode 8 of the Giants of the Faith podcast. My name is Robert Daniels and I'm the host of this show. Giants of the Faith is a podcast where we look at individuals from the age of the church who have lived out their faith in a unique or interesting way. These are people who are giants in the history of Christendom. Hall of Famers, if you will. The subject of today's episode is the famous diminutive Southern Baptist missionary Charlotte Lottie Moon. I say famous because if you've attended a traditional Southern Baptist church for any length of time, you've probably heard of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. But that doesn't mean you really know anything about Lottie Moon. And if you aren't or haven't been part of a traditional Southern Baptist church, then there's a good chance you've never even heard of Lottie Moon. Either way, I hope you'll find this episode informative and enlightening. Charlotte Lottie Diggs Moon was born December 12, 1840, in Albemarle, Virginia, to parents Edward and Anne Maria, who were solidly committed Southern Baptists. The family owned the large Viewmont plantation where they grew tobacco. In 1853, when Lottie was just 13, her father was killed in a riverboat accident. A year later, Lottie left home to attend the Baptist Virginia Female Seminary, which is the present-day Hollins University. While at the school, Lottie excelled academically, yet while she was doing well in school, she was falling away from the faith she'd been raised in. She stopped regular attendance at church and chapel. She told her friends that her middle initial D stood for devil. She was becoming more and more skeptical of Christianity all the time. In 1858, John Broadus, one of the founders of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, held a series of revivals at Lottie's school. Her friends prayed for her, and they hoped that she'd attend. Well, she surprised them, and she showed up at a sunrise prayer meeting. Lottie told her friends how a barking dog had kept her up all night, and while she lay awake, she couldn't help but consider the state of her soul. She prayed and prayed, and on December 21, 1858, she made a public profession of faith. She was baptized the very next day. When I think about Lottie's conversion, I can't help but see the parallels to Adoniram Judson's conversion almost a century earlier. God also used a sleepless night to convict and convert Adoniram and launch him as America's first foreign missionary. You can hear more about Adoniram Judson and his story and his wives in Episode 5 of Giants of the Faith. Well, eventually Lottie learned Latin, Greek, Italian, French, and Spanish at school, and in 1861, she graduated with a master's degree. She was one of the first American women to be awarded a master's degree from a southern school. After graduation, Lottie returned home and stayed with her mother throughout the American Civil War. When the war ended, the Moon family's wealth was gone. Lottie became a teacher at various girls' schools throughout the South. In 1871, Lottie and a friend opened the Cartersville Female High School in Georgia. Lottie joined the Cartersville Baptist Church, and in cooperation with the church, began donating money to a girls' school run by missionaries in North China. I think this is God's way of softening her heart toward foreign missions. We'll soon see that God had more in store for Lottie than teaching in Georgia. Just a year later, Lottie's little sister Edmonia was sent to China as a missionary. In fact, Edmonia was the first single woman that the Southern Baptists had commissioned as a missionary. Edmonia wrote from China urging Lottie to join her. I cannot convince myself that it is the will of heaven that you shall not come. True, you are doing a noble work at home, but are there not some who could fill your place? I don't know anyone who could fill the place offered you here. Edmonia's placement in China and her letters of entreaty were the sound of God knocking on the door to Lottie's heart. Soon after receiving Edmonia's letters, God stopped knocking, and he just kicked the door in. Lottie was seated in the front pew at the Cartersville Baptist one Sunday when the pastor preached on John 4.35, which says, Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields, because they are ready for harvest. As soon as the service was over, Lottie went up to her room to pray. She felt the Lord's calling, 
and so applied to the Southern Baptist Convention for commissioning as a foreign missionary. She was approved by the Foreign Mission Board for service in North China where she would join her sister. Lottie left for China on September 1, 1873, and arrived there a little over a month later on October 7th. She'd suffered horrible seasickness on the trip across the Pacific Ocean, and so was doubly glad to be on solid ground. She made her way to Tingchao in the province of Shandong, where she rejoined her sister. At the time, Shandong was the most densely populated place in the world, and was also only newly open to foreign visitors. Lottie joined with missionaries already in China. She immediately took to learning the local language. She struggled with Mandarin, and she struggled with the locals' hostility toward her. Her nickname among the Chinese was Devil Woman. Once she'd learned enough Mandarin to reply, she retorted, If I'm a devil, who are you? We are all from the first great ancestor. Lottie definitely had some spunk. She had a heart for them, though. She wrote in a letter home, My heart turns longingly toward the city homes grimly closed against us, forbidding our entrance and hating us with a hatred that would vent itself in blood if only they dared. Lottie's first job in China was as a teacher at a boys' school. She felt trapped by this work. She didn't want to have traveled to the other side of the globe just to teach. She began accompanying some of the missionary wives on visitation trips into villages in the surrounding area. While on these trips, she discovered that she loved the idea of one-to-one -one evangelism. She began making trips on her own and eventually had a regular routine of visitation. One time, she took an 11-day visitation trip and traveled to 44 different villages. Lottie began to dress like a native and adopted native customs. Her mission was to share the gospel with the women of China and she felt that this was the best way to accomplish it. With a heart full of joy, she said, It is no effort to speak to the people. The needs of these people press upon my soul, and I cannot be silent. It is grievous to think of these human souls going down to death without even one opportunity of hearing the name of Jesus. Again, I'm reminded of another missionary, this time Ann Judson, who had been a missionary to Burma a century earlier. She, too, shared Lottie's commitment to reaching women who had never heard the word and she also adopted native dress and manners. It was effective for Anne, and it was effective for Lottie. Lottie did suffer from loneliness. She never married, and was practically alone on a continent surrounded by people who looked, spoke, thought, and believed differently than she did. I hope no missionary will ever be as lonely as I have been, she wrote. In 1878, Lottie set up a boarding school for girls. She started with only five students. Chinese culture at the time didn't put much stock in educating girls. Lottie countered this disinterest by covering the cost of books, food, medical support, room, and board for her students. That meant that many poor girls were able to attend and better their futures. Lottie's school provided for the physical, mental, and spiritual needs of its students. One thing that Lottie did that made an impact far beyond her local mission field was to write. She wrote and wrote and wrote letters to churches and women's group in the United States. She begged for workers and resources to continue the spread of the gospel. We implore you to send us help, she said. Let not these heathens sink down into eternal death without one opportunity to hear that blessed gospel, which is to you the source of all joy and comfort. In 1885, Lottie left her school and moved 120 miles to interior China and began evangelizing in the Pingchu and Huangshan areas. She was an effective personal evangelist. Such eager drinking in of the truth, such teachableness I have never seen before, she wrote. They are groping ignorantly after God. Lottie's letters and reports were often published in the Baptist state newspapers. These letters and their call to action spurred Baptist women to organize and raise funds. One time, Lottie asked for the women to consider raising funds for a new house, and the women in Virginia raised $2,500 for the purpose. Eventually, the Women's Missionary Union was formed, and in 1888, the first Baptist Christmas offering was taken, with well over $3,000 raised. 
Lottie continued her ministry in Pingtu and also took on the responsibility of training newly arrived missionaries in Tengchao. During one of these training sessions, the missionaries were surprised that the Bible translation Lottie used was different from the one they had. In actuality, she was reading and translating directly from the Greek New Testament. Despite standing only 4 feet 3 inches, Lottie was never one to back down from anyone. She'd witnessed and experienced the hardships that a missionary faced being alone in a foreign land. She pushed the foreign missionary board to implement a furlough system and bring missionaries home every 10 years or so. She believed it would extend the useful service time of missionaries. Her argument was persuasive and a furlough system was implemented. China, in the late 19th and early 20th century, was a place of turmoil and fighting. There was political and societal upheaval. Through it all, Lottie remained and served her community. Her school was occasionally used as a hospital, and when famine ravaged the area, Lottie would go without food herself, practically starving to let her students eat. By 1912, her health was failing. She was 72 years old and had lived in rough conditions for most of her life. The local food had never agreed with her, and at four feet three inches, she was not the most hale of women. The local missionary doctor recommended she return to the United States to recover. She left China by boat, but would never make it to the U.S. She spent her final hours singing Jesus Loves Me with the ship nurse, and she died on board in the harbor of Kobe, Japan, on Christmas Eve, 1912. She had poured out her life for Christ and the people of China. She'd given her all. The Christmas Missionary Offering was renamed the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering, and it has raised over $1.5 billion since that first collection in 1888. So now I'm going to run off on a personal tangent for a minute. I remember as a kid growing up in the First Baptist Church of Brandon, Florida, filling a plastic rice bowl bank with coins for the Lottie Moon Offering. I didn't know who Lottie was, but I knew that the money we added to the rice bowl would be used for missions. It was a tangible reminder of the importance of foreign missions, and it was something that, even as a kid, I could be involved in. It's the kind of thing I miss in today's churches. I'm a member of a Baptist church today, but it's one of those churches that kind of pretends it isn't Baptist. I feel like we've lost a little bit of that connection to those that have gone before us like Lottie Moon. We give to missions, sure. Our church is very mission-minded at the corporate level, but I don't know that today's churches do enough to move that missional focus down to the individual. I'm not sure what the answer is. Bring back the rice bowls, maybe? Uh, maybe it's just a byproduct of having such large churches these days. I'm not sure, but I know that we can be inspired by the life and the work of someone like Lottie Moon, who gave her all to Christ and to her fellow man. Well, this ends another episode of Giants of the Faith. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you are inspired by the faithfulness of Lottie Moon. If you have any comments or corrections, please send them along to podcast at giantsofthefaith.com. I'd be very happy to hear what you think of the show. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>